Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. And welcome to the Aritech Business Update and Financial Highlights by the Second Quarter of 2020 Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star 0. I would now like to hand the conference to your speaker today, Jill Bayon, Chief Executive Officer. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, good morning, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Hope you, hoping you are all well and safe, and thanks for joining us for our earnings call for the second quarter of 2020 and the first half year. We announced our business and financial update yesterday evening you should be able to access the press release and our earnings presentation on the investors uh, page of our website under webcast and link to slideshow or via the link that was provided in the, in the press release. With me on this call in three different locations this time are Dr. Iman El-Hariri, our Chief Medical Officer, and Eric Soyer, our Chief Financial and Chief Operating Officer. Um, turning to page two, and uh, before starting, throwing your attention to the disclaimer on slide two, and you'll see if you read it, COVID-19 is still there. We are overall succeeding well in minimizing its impacts on our operations, but the pandemic continues obviously to have an impact on our trials, as you will see in the, in the update. Turning to slide three, uh, agenda, so it's the usual quarterly routine. I will start with a short business update. Uh, focusing on the key highlights for the second quarter and year to date. Eric will then present the financial results for the first half of the year and summarize the major uh, news flow and expected milestones for the next 12 months, after which the three of us will be available to respond to your questions. Slide four, before starting the update for completeness, a quick reminder on our company, you know it, uh, leader in red dot cells, um, especially focused on cancer and cancer metabolism. Uh, our focus is on targeting cancer cells' amino, altered amino acid metabolism. With this, we are in really late stage, uh, phase three in pancreatic cancer, phase two in triple negative breast cancer, and a phase two in acute lymphoblast leukemia. And as you know, we have our own production sites, one in Europe uh, in Lyon, one for Europe in Lyon, and one for the US in Princeton. We're listed on Euronext and on NASDAQ, so everything we do is really on the, on the two continents. The graph on the right side, just to remind also, it's the survival curve of our phase two study in second-line pancreatic cancer, which with a 40% reduction in risk of death rate is, to our knowledge, still the strongest result ever seen in a large clinical trial in second-line pancreatic cancer. And it's this phase two that obviously en enabled us to transition to our pivotal phase three, Tribeca one, which will, again, be the main focus of this update. And the highlights of the update are on slide five. Um, it's not only Tribeca One. I'll start with Tribeca One, but there is also an important update on our NOFOS ISTs, NOFOS sponsored trial in second line ALL, and quite some uh, updates on the financials, obviously, second half financials, but also the cash and the financing instruments that we put in place on which uh, Eric will uh, give you the, the feedback. This allows me to start with the, the, the business update on slide six. You see, and uh, it's a reminder, the design of the phase three study, the Tribeca one study. It is, as you know, pivotal randomized phase three trial where we compare the standard of care chemotherapy, which can be Gemcitabine, Pazabrexin, or a combination of 5-FU, leucovorin, and oxaliplatin, Fulfury. Um, and it's a trial with about 500 patients. Um, it's um, with a primary, with a primary uh, endpoint in overall survival. So, you know, it's a trial was launched in 2018. It's now running in more than 85 clinical sites in Europe, 11 countries in Europe and in the United States with a target enrollment of approximately 500 patients. Two PIs, uh, Pascal Amel uh, on the left, the picture on the left is the PI for Europe and Dr. Manuel Hidalgo, the PI for the US. 
And I take the occasion to make a little publicity and uh, invite you to our KOL call uh, with Dr. Hidalgo. It will take place on September 29th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 4 p.m. in continental Europe. And Dr. Hidalgo will there discuss the treatment landscape in pancreatic cancer, focusing on the challenges and opportunities for new treatments, specifically in, in second-line pancreatic uh, cancer. Um, and, and there has been a press release with uh, already an, an, um, a link to this to this to this site uh, to this uh, KOL event. So Trebeka one, um, moving to slide seven, the key highlights for the year to date in March. Uh, it was still first quarter, but we, for reminders, we had our third independent safety review by our IDMC. This time it was on third, the, the first 320 patients in the trial. And again, it was a confirmation of the safety profile of area space. The IDMC recommended to continue the trial as planned without amendments. Then in April, the, we got the fast track designation granted by the FDA. We were very pleased because it's obviously a clear confirmation of the unmet medical need in second line pancreatic cancer and of the interest in the results that we had shown so far in the phase two um, study. And then more recently, uh, our trial past the 90% bar, 90% enrollment bar. We have now more than 450 of the approximately 500 patients randomized, and we're on track for complete enrollment in the fourth quarter. Over the past months, uh, since the COVID-19 outbreak, um, our clinical teams and investigators have made a tremendous effort to ensure the continui continuity of the trial, all while prioritizing obviously the safety of the patients, the staff, and the employees. Um, you know, it, we experienced some slowdown in our enrollment, especially with March, April, somewhat in May, but it picked up again to pre-COVID levels as of, as of June. Um, we mentioned in the last time also the events are taking longer than we originally, the events that will trigger the interim analysis um, are taking a bit longer than we originally expected. But now we can confirm based on a better view on, on the events that the uh, two-thirds of the events that will trigger the interim analysis uh, are expected to accrue before the end of the year. The reporting where we originally said around year end, we didn't know whether the interim analysis would come before or after the end of the year. Uh, now, given that this, so what we still see, although in fact overall operationally COVID has no impact or little impact on, on enrollment, et cetera, where we see the most of the impact is on data cleaning. So, Prudence-wise, we will now guide it more towards Q1, hopefully early Q1, for the interim analysis. Quick reminder on the interim analysis. Uh, it is an interim analysis for superiority only, no futility analysis. Uh, so two possible outcomes, the IDMC, and then it's important to, 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 to make this clear. So it's, we are totally blinded to the study. It is the independent data monitoring, monitoring committee that will look at the data so far, the 200, uh, the two-thirds of the events, and they can then or conclude that the trial already met its planned primary overall survival endpoint and recommend to stop the trial, to conclude the trial, or they can recommend to continue the trial as planned until the final analysis, uh, and this is as before expected in the second half of 2021. So it's an error in the slide, this is the second half of 2021. Um, so that's about the phase three in second line pancreatic cancer. Um, gaining in importance and moving now to slide eight is the work we're doing in ALL. In fact, it's not us doing it. It's the NOFO, the Nordic Society of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology. who are running this investigator-sponsored trial. Uh, obviously, we, do, we produce the batches and we provide all the support uh, that we can. Uh, this is a trial running in 22 clinical sites in the Nordic and Baltic countries of Europe with primary endpoint pharmacokinetics and, and safety. This trial, we announced it in June, reached its target enrollment. It, in fact, it's enlarged target enrollment. Originally, it was 30 patients. It was expanded to 50. And finally, we completed, there was some over-enrollment, and we completed and concluded the enrollment at, or they completed at 55 page, patients. The NOFO has uh, provided some preliminary findings, and we're very encouraged by them, so because they suggest that 
area space achieved its target level and duration of aspirogenase activity, which is the primary endpoint, associated with acceptable associated with an acceptable safety profile. So now it's waiting for the for the results, the uh, the final results. We expect them before year ends, and. It's important because um, we know this is a high unmet medical need. Uh, patients who develop allergy to pegylated asparaginase have very li little treatment options left. There is only urbanase, and urbanase is experiencing uh, still and, 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 and since a long time um, supply shortages. So the need for a second um, asparaginase in this setting is, is obvious. The FDA confirmed this in an initial meeting we had with them. So now, based on what we will see in the phase in the in the final final um, results, we will plan to uh, go further with the FDA and discuss a potential path to a BLA uh, in second line ALA. So um, for the NOFO trial, um, on the two other clinical trials, slide nine. Uh, in fact, it's for completeness, there is not much to to single here. Uh, more because there's nothing new here. The Tribeca 2 trial in triple negative breast cancer continues to be enrolling in uh, 17 sites in, in three countries. And the target enrollment is uh, 64 patients. Um, the enrollment we mentioned last time is still slower than we, than we hoped, and we are ex assessing options to accelerate this enrollment in view of still being able to report results in 2021, most likely the end of 21. And then the phase one IST in first-line pancreatic cancer. Um, this is a trial um, where area space will be, the safety of area space will be uh, evaluated in combination with full furinox, a, a treatment regimen that is gaining increasing ground in first-line treatment of pancreatic cancer. And so Georgetown University will, will has, is sponsoring this trial. They obtained the IND to start to get started. All the, the paperwork is ready, and so now we can confirm that we expect the trial to start enrolling, we said, in the second half of 2020, so it will become the fourth quarter of 2020. With this, I conclude the business update, uh, and I now hand over to Eric to provide, to provide an update on the financial results, first half of 2020, and on the recent financing activities and cash projections. Eric. All yours. Thank you. Thank you, Gilles. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour à tous. Uh, we're now reviewing the financial highlights for the first half of this year. We're on slide 10 of the slide deck. And we're starting with PL information. The net loss for the first half of this year, 2020, was 35 million euro. Uh, that's, that was up 5.7 million euro, or 19% year over year. Uh, and uh, with uh, this is due uh, to a 5.1 million increase in operating loss and a 0 0.6 million decrease in financial income. The increase in operating loss, 5.1 million, was attributable to a 6.1 million increase in preclinical and clinical development expenses, a 2.1 million euro decrease in GNA, of which 2.3 million was related to the end of manufacturing capacity expenses, which were mostly incurred last year, 2019, uh, and the 1.1 million decrease in income, uh, of which 0.9 million consisted in the upfront payment from the June 2019 last year license agreement with SKUs Biotechnologies, which obviously did not recur uh, this year in 2020. So those were the key highlights for the PNR information. And we're now moving on to slide 11 for comments on cash. And we're starting with the mid-year cash position. As of June 30 this year, Aritech had cash and cash equivalents totaling 45.4 million euro, which is approximately 51 million US dollar. And that compared with 73.2 million at the end of December 2019, and 58.6 million at the end of Q1 this year. So that means we had a 27.7 million decrease in cash position during the first six months of 2020, and, uh, which were consisting of 14.6 million 
in the first quarter of this year and 13.1 million in the second quarter. And that was the result of the 28 million net cash utilization, which was mostly comprised of a 29.2 million net utilization in operating activities, 1.1 million used for investing activities, and 2.2 million generated in financing activities. In the period also, uh, we had the appreciation uh, of the US dollar against the euro, uh, which led to a 0.4 million favorable currency exchange impact. Those were the, the highlights on the uh, cash flow for the first six months of this year. And now a word on our most recent financing initiatives. And we're now on slide number 12 of this presentation. First, I'd like to recall that we signed an agreement in June this year with um, Alpha Blue Ocean, ABO, and European High Growth Opportunities Securitization Fund. And that was for the issuance of a zero-coupon convertible note uh, with share warrants attached, whereby the investors committed to subscribe for up to a maximum of 60 million euro in the event of conversion, conversion of all the notes. This is currently subject to a regulatory limit uh, of 20% dilution. And therefore, and obviously depending on market conditions, we may not be able to use it up for the maximum of 60 million unless we seek further authorization. To date, the company has called two tranches of 3 million each, one in July and the other one in August. And therefore, these drawdowns are not yet reflected in the company's cash position at the end of June. Second, and, and today, and this is new, uh, Eritech has also announced the implementation of an at-the-market or ATM program, which will allow us at Eritech's discretion to issue and sell ordinary shares in the form of ADSs, Amer American Depository Shares, on the NASDAQ market through its uh, sale agent, Carbon & Company. That will be sales to eligible investors at a price equal or ne near to the prevailing market price on NASDAQ, keeping in mind that the issuance of new shares will also be subject to the same 20% dilution limit as for the ABO convertible notes. Please note that uh, a new shelf registration statement on Form F3 was filed with the SEC yesterday, which is merely a rollover of the shelf registration we already filed last year, and that will cover this ATM program. Of course, the ATM program, program can only be used once the shelf registration statement is declared effective by the SEC. And thirdly, uh, the impact on our cash horizon. This new ATM facility, uh, together with the ABO convertible notes, is complementing our financing solutions and further extending our cash horizon. We believe that these new financing instruments, altogether, will now extend our cash horizon to the end of the third quarter of 2021 which is beyond the expected upcoming data readouts in ALL, the phase two no for trial, and in second line pancreatic cancer with the interim analysis for superiority. This runway projection is of course, again, taking into account the 20% regulatory dilution limit, unless we are again further authorized to use these instruments beyond this current limit. That was the, the summary of our most recent financing initiatives. I am now turning to slide 13 of this presentation for a quick wrap up of the upcoming news flows and, and key milestones. Starting first with, uh, with the Tribeca 1 phase 3 study, uh, with more than 90% patients of the trial, uh, we expect to be able to complete enrollment in this study in the coming months. Around the same time and before the end of the year, we expect the full results of the phase two study in second line ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We expect this full result will be, report, will be reported before the end of the year. Again, this study, which we call NOFO, is an investigator sponsored trial and is conducted in the Nordic and Baltic countries of Europe. You certainly remember that we provided an interim update on this trial last June, and the final results should now be expected for the end of the year. But again, keeping in mind that this is an investigator-led trial, so which is to say that we're not fully in charge of the timeline here. 
Next is the initiation of a phase one study in first line metastatic pancreatic cancer. This will also be an investigator sponsored trial in the US with the George Jones Lombardy Cancer Center. And we expect to start patient enrollment also before the end of this year. And finally, but certainly very importantly as a company milestone, is the interim analysis for superiority in the Tribeca 1 study, the phase three clinical trial in second line metastatic pancreatic cancer. As explained earlier by Gilles, we now expect this interim readout in the first quarter of 2021, with again, two possible outcomes. Either we can conclude early for superiority, if the primary survival endpoint is already met with only two thirds of, two -thirds of the event, or we continue towards the final analysis, which is expected in the second half of 2021. With that, I would like to thank you already for your attention, and we will now open the call for any questions you may have. Again, I would like to remind any of you who would like to ask questions in French that you are, of course, very welcome to do so. Nous allons maintenant ouvrir la session de questions-réponses, et pour ceux d'entre vous qui préféreraient poser des questions en français, c'est évidemment avec plaisir que nous échangerons en français. Operator, Joel, this is over to you. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star one on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Our first question comes from Fred Gomez with Farium Securities. Your line is now open. Yes, thank you for, for taking my questions. I have a few. Uh, the first on, on, on Tribeca 1 in uh, Pancreatic Cancer, we are now approaching the completion of the recruitment. Uh, can you tell us, uh, can you give us an update about uh, the geographic breakdown between the U.S. versus Europe, how many patients for each zone, and, uh, and also uh, what you see for the, for the interim analysis? And uh, do you expect uh, to have more patients treated with uh, the combination jetstamine nab uh, nab uh, versus uh, versus fall free, or how it gonna how it gonna play? And and do you know exactly how many events you, you have now? Because uh, we expect uh, the interim to to come shortly, but it seems that uh, you don't have uh, at uh, at this stage the, the the total number of events uh, requested. So how many how many events uh, are missing now? Uh, the second question still it's more on the on the regulatory side um, of course the US is the primary efficacy endpoint but it's likely that uh, agencies will have a look at the totality of the data generated in in the phase three um, you mentioned uh, that uh, there is a, a stratification by chemo regimen uh, can we expect maybe if you miss the, the primary to identify maybe a subset of, uh, of patients that uh, that uh, responded with the better OS and, and also maybe a, a PFS. Uh, so, are, are you going to play with the, with the regulatory? Uh, are you going to play with the regulatory uh, discussion in the future? And the last one is uh, for the the, no, the the phase two in uh, in leukemia. Uh, can we expect uh, something at ASH this year? Thank you very much. Thank you, Frédéric. Uh, I think these are all perfect questions for Iman. Uh, Iman, can, okay. can you take them? Yes, sure. Um, uh, good afternoon, Frederick. Um, hope you can hear me well. Um, so, new first question around the geographic breakdown. Uh, I think if everyone knew the line is. So, uh, we, you know, this is a uh, European US trial. Uh, the study started um, uh, in Europe long before it started in the United States, so we expect that the majority of the patients will come from Europe, um, and we expect up to maybe between 5 to 10 percent or a little more uh, will come from the U.S. Uh, region. So, so this is the geographical breakdown. And just a reminder, we are not stratifying per region in, in the trial, so uh, just um, as FYI. In terms of the split of this, uh, the backbone chemotherapy, gemabraxin versus irinity can be chemo. Um, we, since France is the highest enrolling country in the trial, we have more regime abraxine um, as opposed to irinity can. But overall, uh, given the other European countries, the percentage is 
um, we do, I don't have the, the most recent um, split, uh, but our expectation, it will be in the range of um, maybe 60 to 40, um, a little less, a little give or take, um, in favor of the gym abraxin, um, a backbone chemotherapy. In terms of the number of events for the interim analysis, um, as Jill mentioned earlier, uh, we are expecting this to be before year end. Um, um, we are we are tracking the number of events on um, regularly every other week. But as you would expect, and particularly in this patient population, that the events actually they, they come in uh, in boluses in bulk. So some may come soon or come later. Um, and so overall, we are, um, we are almost approaching the required number of events, the two thirds of, uh, of, of the events in the trial. So um, we, we are almost towards, uh, you know, approaching 90% of the, of the events. So we are very confident that we will accrue all the events before uh, year end. On your next question regarding the, um, the totality of the data and the stratification, we do stratify where the chemotherapy backbone, so it would be the gym abdexin versus irinity can uh, based chemotherapy. The irinity can here can be the generic irinity can come to the or only five plus five heliocovorin. The study, the primary endpoint will be the overall survival in the ITT population, regardless of the backbone chemotherapy. However, we are building a hierarchical um, analysis in the trials to avoid multiplicity issues. So um, the next will be looking at progression-free survival, and then we'll be also looking at the subset of uh, patients in each chemotherapy arm. And this will also be, um, uh, we look at it in, in all the subpopulations, i.e. the intent to treat, the PEP protocol, and of course, um, in all the first plot, and look at the consistency of treatment. And to your question, um, you need to achieve a positive result in the ITT, regardless of the backbone chemotherapy. However, there might be when you start looking at each uh, chemo uh, subset, you may see a favorable response, and that would be something to the agency to, to decide. Uh, but they will not be able to look at this unless you have a, a positive trial overall. And then on your last question, which is the ALL, yes, the answer um, is the answer that um, it, I, the sponsor, i.e. the NOFO uh, group, uh, have submitted abstract to ASH, and the expectation is that uh, they will be presenting the final full data at ASH uh, this year if their abstract is accepted. I think this summarizes everything, so I uh, hope I answered all your questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Renny Benjamin with JMP Securities. Your line is now open. Hi, this is Justin Walsh on for Renny. Uh, assuming that Tribeca 1 succeeds and aerospace is approved in second-line pancreatic cancer, how quickly do you guys think you'd be able to ramp up to meet the potential demand? And then related to that, is the Lyon facility sufficient to supply Europe and the Princeton facility sufficient to supply the US? I'm just sort of thinking in the, in the context of a COVID world where cross-Atlantic uh, uh, transport of, of things might be more complicated. Hi, Justin. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll answer these. So, so um, yes, indeed. It's a lot of work ongoing in the company, sort of planning for success. Um, it is true that our, and, and independent of COVID, uh, so we are now producing in U.S. for U.S. and in Europe for Europe. Uh, Princeton is our first facility in the U.S. It's been uh, designed to be to meet the clinical demand, but also early commercial. Um, and the same for the Lyon facility, clinical and, and early commercial. And we anticipate that we can cover the first year, year and a half um, of, of, of launch 
uh, from these facilities. But you can imagine as soon as we see positive data appearing that we will have a, a lot of efforts ongoing on design and setting up the, the next facility in the U.S., most likely one on the West Coast, uh, just to cover geographically, uh, the, 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 because there is a logistics component uh, non-negligible uh, in, in this product. So, And in, in Europe, most likely more towards the north of Europe for, for our second facility. So teams are currently preparing the, the readiness for this sort of site selection or at least location selection. And then, indeed, we've shown it in Princeton that we can pull this off very quickly the, the, from sort of decision to operational readiness. And uh, I hope we will have to do that soon uh, again, both in Europe and in the U.S. Thank you. And, and if I can, just one follow-up. Um, from your just discussions with physicians and, and KOLs in both the EU and U.S., uh, how aware are they of the sort of the potential benefits of of aerospace and uh, sort of how much legwork do you guys anticipate having to do versus physicians coming to you since there's so much unmet need? I think on, on it, it's a bit both. So yes, uh, there is still not enough uh, knowledge about the product. Uh, we, we realize this. We are a relatively small company. We're a relatively new kid on the block. Now, the thing is that we are very high on the radar screen, especially in, in both in pancreatic cancer and in, in ALS, because in pancreatic cancer, in fact, second line, you, you know it, nothing worked, uh, nothing works. As uh, so if we will have, would have positive results there, I think, yes, uh, there's a closed community, the, 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 the GI uh, oncologist. So the, this would go quickly. We would need, and it's part of our planning for success, uh, increase the efforts on, on medical affairs, awareness creation, et cetera. And the, the plans are, are there, uh, the money not yet, but uh, that's what we're uh, getting, getting ready. Um, and I would say the, the same in Europe. Um, so that's um, work to be done, but we have a team that is preparing the ground. Thank you guys for taking the questions. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. As a reminder to ask a question, you will need to press star one on your telephone. Our next question comes from Boris Peaker with Cowan. Your line is now open. Uh, great. Uh, my first question is on the impact of COVID. Uh, we saw patients in general in various clinical trials skipping their follow-up appointments and only showing up for treatment appointments. Can you just remind us how frequently do patients need to show up in the Tribeca study, how frequently are there just the follow-up appointments versus treatment appointments? Iman, can you take this question also? Yes. Uh, hello, Boris. Um, so, um, in the treatment, it's, uh, it, it's clearly dictated by uh, the treatment itself. Um, and as you know, the schedule is um, it's all, every two weeks in the study. It's a four-week cycle. Once patients uh, go into um, a perhaps um, either disease progression mode, they are followed up for survival. And at that point, it is eight, every eight week um, visit. So this is the plan. Um, we, we need to remember also um, overall for survival, it can be a physical visit or it can be a phone call or in a different modes of communication to get that, um, that event uh, for, for, the, uh, for the survival. Um, so far on the impact of COVID, yes, there were actually very uh, minimal delays in terms of the, the patient follow-up during the, um, you know, the, um, the heat of the pandemic back in March and April. Uh, but overall, as we are going through the extensive data cleaning in preparation for the interim analysis, um, we are seeing and we are reviewing the, the, uh, the database um, as we speak. We, uh, we are not necessarily seeing uh, a lot of, um, of these delays in terms of um, getting the end of treatment um, plan at least not different from what you would otherwise see in, um, in a non-COVID situation. So, um, so this is where we are at this moment. I think, again, uh, the good thing for the study, it is a survival, and, and that's what we'll be able, one way or the other, 
to, um, to, to capture. Gotcha. And my second question is on the ALL study being run by the NOFA group. I'm just curious, what efficacy results do you think uh, we'd need to see to satisfy the FDA for approval based on this data? Man, I suggest you continue. Okay, I'll, I'll take that. Um, so uh, the primary endpoint is looking at the pharmacological profile of ADSPAS in patients who have uh, experienced hypersensitivity reaction to prior um, asparaginase. Actually, it's really uh, Oncospar which is the pegylated asparaginase. So in terms of the pharmacological profile, it's um, asparaginase activity, so achieving a certain level of um, um, asparaginase uh, in the circulation and, um, and not being uh, um, diminished in terms of the activity in the presence of perhaps neutralizing antibodies or, um, or anti-asparaginase antibodies. So uh, this primary endpoint is the, the, the major primary outcome for the trial. And from a regulatory perspective, um, the FDA has established this as an acceptable surrogate endpoint for approving asparaginase um, formulations in, uh, in ALN. Uh, in addition to this primary endpoint, we will have um, a whole battery of, of other endpoints. We will be uh, clearly looking at uh, which is something the FDA would like to see. For example, the neither level of asparaginase activity. This is something which was um, certainly looked into in the most recent asparaginase approval, the asparalis. Um, and then, of course, the safety, um, anti-asparaginase antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, all of these will, uh, these are the supportive data that the FDA would expect to see. And that's also part of what uh, we have received in terms of their feedback to us uh, early this year. All right, but do you have any specific numbers for the levels that you think we'd need to see? The, the numbers, it's, um, right now, it's, uh, what is accepted is 100 uh, uh, units per, uh, per liter as the acceptable level. And in, in fact, in, in all our trials, we exceed this level uh, by um, a very wide uh, margin for a long gotcha. period of time. Gotcha. Thanks for taking my questions. Thank, Thank you. you for asking. I'm not showing any further questions at this time. I would now like to turn the call back over to Jill Bayon for closing remarks. Great. Um, I, want, I just want to thank everyone for your participation and attention and questions, obviously. Thanks also for your continued support. Um, we look forward to keeping you updated on the progress through the remainder of this year and, and next year exciting new slow coming uh, uh, at least at the horizon. So thanks again for joining and uh, wish you all a, a great day. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.